All right, everyone, uh, moving into uh, part two of the fertilizers. Uh, today, I'm going to jump into uh, <clears throat> the other two alternate nitrogen sources. We're going to talk about uh, ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, and uh, then we're going to finish off by talking about uh, phosphorus, potassium, micronutrient levels, and how soil pH affects the availability of all of it. So <clears throat> anyway, let's jump in. First, let's talk about ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate. Uh, so I will call these AN and AS. Um, Ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate are known for providing a really quick green color. And uh, as we talked about before, uh, you know how urea is going to have to convert into ammonia gas uh, for the plant to utilize that as a, as a nitrogen source. It'll use, utilize the ammonia gas and then it'll also break down that ammonia gas into nitrate, uh, which the, the plant will mostly use as nitrate, but it'll also take in some as uh, the ammonia gas. Uh, so um, ammonia nitrate, uh, when it interacts with water, uh, with, with H2O, uh, we're going to get <clears throat> NH4, and uh, we're also going to get uh, N3, which would be nitrate and ammonium. Uh, so Immediately, once interacting with water, we have an available nitrogen source. Just bam, ready to go. Again, this is going to fall victim to volatility. We're going to lose some to the atmosphere. We're going to lose some to runoff. We're going to lose some to leaching. Uh, so, not a highly efficient fertilizer, uh, but as far as the, uh, the greening effect of it, there's nothing that greens faster than ammonium nitrate. Uh, second to ammonium nitrate would be ammonium sulfate. Uh, so when it reacts with water, uh, we're going to get uh, NH, NH4 and then we're also going to get SO2 uh, sulfate. Uh, so the sulfur, you know, of course with the, with the, with the NH4, uh, you know, we get that immediate greening effect. The sulfur, however, is going to be one of those, one of those not really talked about uh, micronutrients. When you think micronutrients, you're going to think iron, calcium, magnesium, manganese, zinc, molybdenum. Uh, but sulfur actually does play an important part. And depending on the turf manager you talk to, you're going to get several different uh, opinions on sulfur. Uh, me personally, I'm super pro, pro sulfur. Uh, yes, it does acidify the soils very, very, very slightly though. It takes a lot more sulfur to acidify a soil than it does lime uh, to unacidify a soil. You can raise the pH much easier than you can lower the pH. How about that? <clears throat> so anyway, Sulfur it plays a critical part in uh, the photosynthesis process. So sulfur alone applied to turf grass is going to give a greening effect. Uh, and in fact, it, it makes up uh, an unbelievable amount of the plant. I want to say it's like up to 1% uh, of the plant is, uh, is actually uh, composed of sulfur. Uh, so it, it does play an important role in, in plants. Uh, so let's jump into the rest of the equation here. So we have, you know, as we talked about before, you know, we were talking about a 4600. This is N. This middle number here is P. P is phosphorus. And then our last number is K, potassium. NPK. So let's talk about phosphorus first. All right, so phosphorus is uh, in the in the scale of uh, you know one through three. Nitrogen is going to be most important for the plant. 
Um, potassium is going to be second most important. Third would be phosphorus. Uh, where phosphorus uh, actually is, is utilized by the plant is going to be uh, uh, plant establishment and uh, root development. Uh, so here is how phosphorus works. So phosphorus is going to be used during the uh, <clears throat> rooting and uh, seedling development as, as far as the, the plant's concerned. Uh, most soils, uh, clay soils at least, are going to have a lot of phosphorus in them. The problem is, is that phosphorus is very rarely readily available. Um, and it's pretty easy to tell when you have uh, low, low P in your soils during time of establishment because the seedlings, seedlings uh, in low P uh, are going to have uh, red or purplish color. That'll be low P. And, and usually it's not because there's no phosphorus in the soil, it's mostly because phosphorus is tied up in the soil. Uh, so the problem is, is when P is available in acidic soils, it's going to be quick to bind with, uh, with iron, uh, it'll bind with aluminum uh, or manganese uh, to, to form an insoluble compound where the plant cannot, the, the roots of the plant cannot use it. Uh, and the same thing uh, in uh, high pH soils and in, in basic soils, uh, it's going to bind with uh, calcium. When phosphorus combines with calcium, it forms an insoluble compound that the, uh, the plant cannot use. So <clears throat> here's the other thing. When you apply a phosphorus fertilizer, it's one of the probably the most important things to keep in mind when you apply a phosphorus fertilizer. So say you go out with a, a 10, 10, 10, right? That's, uh, that's 10, 10 pounds of, uh, that's 10% phosphorus of your 50 pound bag, right? Uh, when, when you apply this phosphorus, it may take weeks or months for that phosphorus to move even a few inches in the soil. So here's your soil line, here's your phosphorus. You're looking at, you know, we'll, we'll call this one inch, we'll call this two inch, we'll call this three inches. So during seedling development here, it doesn't take long for those roots to get down, you know, close to this one inch mark. Well, it may take weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it may take a couple months, depending on your soil composition, for that phosphorus to even be readily available in the soil to, to, to reach the depth for these, these roots of your seedlings uh, to be able to utilize it. So that's one thing to keep in mind that you know during, during seeding time, it may be wise in August uh, <clears throat> to go ahead and put down your, your, your pea uh, fertilizer so that way at time of seeding when you aerate and overseed, it, the plant will be uh, your seedlings will be able to utilize that, that pea in the ground. Um, other things that, you know, we talked about acidic soils and basic soils are going to bind up phosphorus. Uh, so it's important that for phosphorus to be available to the plant, that we want to keep the pH uh, between 6 and 7. And there's going to be a whole host of things we talk about in regards to soil pH. So I'll save that for later on, uh, but just keep that in mind how uh, soil pH can affect the availability of phosphorus for the plant to utilize. So then we'll move on to the last part of the equation, which would be K, or potassium, and uh, we'll have a little bit more to talk about there. So potassium is, it's touted to do a lot of things in turf grass. Um, some of it is debatable uh, from a, a research perspe uh, perspective. Uh, some of it is proven, uh, but we'll go ahead and hit the, uh, the, the highlights of it. Uh, so here's what p potassium does in the plant. It mostly deals with the chemical processes in the plant. <clears throat> it, it, it's not going to stimulate you know, a ton of green growth like nitrogen does. Uh, potassium isn't going to uh, 
uh, you know, correct seedling vigor. Uh, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, uh, you know, purple or uh, reddish color uh, fescue seedlings that are starting to come up. Um, however, what it is going to do, uh, potassium, uh, it, one, uh, CO2 uptake, it's going to regulate that. So, uh, obviously, you know, plants, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about them is that they're able to utilize CO2 to turn it into energy and food and release oxygen back into the environment. Potassium plays an important part of that CO2 regulation, the uptake of it. Um, so it's going to have an effect on CO2 use. Uh, it's also going to affect uh, ATP production. Uh, ATP is going to be uh, the energy source for most of these chemical processes that take place in the plant. So it's, it's super important. ATP, ATP, without the energy for these chemical processes to take place, uh, you know, the plant is not going to be able to survive. Um, uh, potassium also plays a part in uh, water use regulation. Uh, so potassium is going to regulate how much water is taken up through the roots of the plant and how much uh, the water is going to be lost through the leaf surface through transpiration through the stomata in the, in the leaves. Um, so those are, are two other things to, to keep in mind. Your potassium has a direct influence on uptake to the roots and transpiration loss. Uh, and then, which also kind of ties into uh, drought resistance and disease resistance. Um, this is where the research gets a little bit debatable. Um, yes, it has been shown to uh, offer some form of, of drought resistance. Uh, is, does this mean that if you go out with high amounts of potassium out on your lawn, that it's never gonna become drought stress? No, that's not what that means. Uh, <clears throat> but if you do enter through a period of, uh, of drought and then you do start getting rain again, how many plants are you going to lose? Uh, that are How many plants are actually gonna die? Um, as long as you have adequate uh, potassium, you're probably not going to lose as many plants as you would if they were potassium deficient. Uh, same thing with disease resistance. This is also kind of uh, debatable. Um, it has been shown to show as long as adequate potassium levels are, are maintained and the plant is utilizing it correctly, uh, it does. It has almost a hardening off effect of the plant. Um, which will help and help it in turn fight disease. Uh, that goes back to the energy processes of the plant with the ATP and whatnot. Uh, as long as that's actively taking place uh, at a at a normal rate, and uh, you know the the optimum amount of health is there, it's going to be a little more resistance toward disease. That doesn't mean if you go out with high amounts of potassium that you're not going to get brown patch in your lawn. That that it, it doesn't work like that. But again, it's back towards, you know, putting together that total picture of a, uh, you know, having adequate nutrition in all areas around for that, that plant to be uh, healthy and vigorously growing. And uh, by doing so, it should be able to, to ward off disease better than, you know, an unfertilized lawn. So... And then as that goes, you know, symptoms of low K are going to be chlorosis. Uh, so low K, it's going to be chlorotic. And uh, that usually that means that the leaves themselves are turning yellow. Uh, you will see a slow or stunted growth. Uh, it's like you just, you, you can't get the grass to grow and uh, you pull a soil test and then all of a sudden it's showing, you know, you've got next to no no available K in the ground. Uh, you know, it's time to do do a, a good app of potassium sulfate or uh, muriate of potash. Uh, and a, again, you know, uh, with uh, drought and temperature changes, if you are if you are if parts of your yard are dying with drought and 
temper, temperature changes, it could be a sign of low K. Uh, again, when you're testing for P and K, so you know, we'll go back to the N, P, and K, right? These two need to be checked by a soil test. Uh, most soil tests do not test for N because it, it, it moves so quickly through the soil and it is so quickly utilized by the plant uh, that you know if you do an application of urea and then you, you test the soil three weeks later, it may show that it's low in, in nitrogen. Uh, but you just did a fertilizer app three weeks ago. How can that be? Well, most of it's used or is volatilized by then. Um, so most soil tests don't test for nitrogen, but do test for phosphorus and potassium uh, because they do not move through the soil very quickly and plants do not utilize them at the rate of nitrogen. All right. So how does this tie in? We, we, we've got our, these are called our macronutrients. So we have our macronutrients from here. We have our micronutrients. So micronutrients are gonna play parts of, uh, you know, maintaining the health of the plant and uh, into the uh, photosynthesis process and uh, the development of chlorophyll. Uh, chlorophyll, of course, is with the, the green pigment that makes grass so pretty. So the more chlorophyll our plant has, the greener our grass will be. And, uh, and so that's where, you know, nitrogen in conjunction with our micronutrients can, you know, push that color as, as far as we can get it. So our most popular micronutrients are going to be iron, uh, magnesium, uh, manganese, uh, sulfur, uh, we've got zinc, we've got molybdenum, uh, calcium is going to be an important one. Uh, so these are going to be our main, most important ones here. And, uh, and so what, where our soil pH becomes, uh, important is every one of these, every one of their, their availabilities is influenced by soil pH. Uh, so if you've got high pH, you know, parts of it may not be available. So high pH, you know, probably you're not going to have a lot of iron available. If you've got, you know, low pH, you're probably going to have, you know, a ton of iron available. Uh, <clears throat> but you, you may be lower in, you know, calcium or manganese. So let's look at a soil pH chart and uh, we can get a better idea of what's going to be available uh, based on our soil pH. So if you've never seen one of these, let me... Let me explain to you how to read it real quick. So right here in the center, we have our pH of 7. And then we have our micronutrients above, well, macro and micronutrients. So starting at your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, uh, copper, and zinc, and molybdenum. So you can see here at a pH of 7, molybdenum is readily available for, you know, it's, it's very available for the plant. Copper and zinc, available for the plant. Boron, available for the plant. Manganese, available for the plant. A little bit, not as much as available for the plant as, you know, a pH of 6, uh, but it is still available. Magnesium <coughs> is available for the plant. Calcium, sulfur, potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen is all available for the plant. So, when it comes to the greening of the grass, you know, the most important ones are going to be our nitrogen, is going to be sulfur, <coughs> calcium, magnesium, iron, and manganese. Just to kind of give you an idea of how these, uh, you know, micronutrients can affect green grass, uh, if you have ever taken a bag of Epsom salt, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, and put it down on a yard, <coughs> it's going to green up the yard incredibly. Uh, in fact, I like to use Epsom salt around uh, a lot of uh, flowers and shrubs. Uh, it just does a fantastic job. Uh, we use it a lot in Georgia on, uh, on zoysia grass and, uh, and centipede. It did, did great things for centipede. And per perennial rye loves it. If uh, <laughs> uh, There's a, 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 an old school fertilizer out there called uh, Rainbow, uh, Super Rainbow, and it had magnesium sulfate in it. And uh, man, that that just perennial rye loved that super rainbow. So did so did the the plants and shrubs. That's mostly what I used it for. So, anyways, we see here 
you know, out here on the east, on the eastern half of the United States, we're mostly dealing with low pH soils. So, you know, we don't need to apply a lot of iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc <clears throat> unless our, our, you know, soil test shows that we don't have any in the ground. Where we do need to focus on uh, is, you know, phosphorus availability, uh, potassium availability, sulfur availability, calcium availability, and magnesium. Here's the great thing about us being in the South. Uh, we can supply calcium and magnesium through uh, dolomitic lime. Dolomitic lime is, <clears throat> it supplies just that, calcium and magnesium. Uh, so, you know, that way we'll have it readily available. It's also going to work on moving our pH up from a 6 to a 7, and uh, which will make more calcium, magnesium, sulfur, potassium, phosphorus. Uh, available. Uh, for the guys who are working on the high pH scale, uh, you know, you can see that <clears throat> you've got plenty of calcium and magnesium available. Phosphorus starts to get a little deficient, you know, as you start creeping in towards the eight, eight and a half mark, uh, you know, same with nitrogen, but you really start to lose iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc. So what happens in, in this particular, in, you know, areas with high pH, your grass will start to go chlorotic for the opposite reason because you have no iron and manganese. <clears throat> and uh, if you've ever used an iron, uh, a liquid iron, a lot of times it's going to be uh, iron and manganese in, in solution that, that you spray out. And that will correct your, your chlorosis issue. However, uh, you know, what you should be work on, working on doing is acidifying that soil. Uh, so, you know, fertilizers like ammonium sulfate will do that, or actual applications of sulfur itself uh, will work towards lowering that, that pH. It is harder to lower the pH than it is to raise the pH. That's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, so, if y'all have never seen this before, uh, it's available online pretty much anywhere. Just do a quick Google search and you can find, uh, you know, you can find this chart here. Uh, but again, this is it, basically you can take your um, your soil test that you get back. You can set it down, you know, right next to you. Pull up this chart, <clears throat> and as long as your soil test says you have adequate levels of everything, you can look at the pH and see exactly where your plant is able to use it and where it's not able to use it. So if you come back and you got a pH of 4.5, is that the the only thing that's keeping that grass green <clears throat> is is being able to utilize the amount of iron in the ground because <clears throat> nothing else is relatively available. And if you got a pH of 4.5, chances are it doesn't look great. There, there's also a chance it, it may not look bad, uh, especially if you got centipede grass. 4.5 is probably optimal. Uh, 4.5 to 5.5 is, is optimal you know, for its growing conditions. Uh, but if you're trying to grow a fescue at a 4.5 to 5, uh, yeah, it's going to be a little thin, it'll be a little weak, it, it, every time you, you pound it with fertilizer, you know, it's just not going to retain its color very well, and uh, you're not going to get that same amount of vigorous growth as you would uh, if you had a, a pH of 7 there. So, anyway y'all, that's going to get it for the video on uh, the remainder of nitrogen sources and uh, how nutrients are utilized by the turf grass. Um, this is at least a, a pretty basic in introduction to how, how all of it's done. Uh, and you know, some people will tell you fertilizer is fertilizer, and uh, that can be the case, but that's also not always the case. Uh, it's important to understand your soils and understand why you're applying what you're applying. And uh, I hope that, you know, by seeing this video that you'll be able to make more of an educated decision as to uh, you know, what you're going to apply and why you're going to apply it. So anyway, y'all, that's got it for me. Uh, just to kind of recap, ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, readily available ammonium sulfate is going to be a little more acidifying because of that sulfur content. The sulfur is still going to be good for turf grass health. Um, <clears throat> P and K, um, potassium is going to focus more on energy processes in the plant. Uh, so, you know, things like ATP, water regulation, CO2 uptake. Uh, and uh, phosphorus is going to deal more with root development uh, more than anything else. <clears throat> and then our micronutrients, micronutrients are going to play a big role in um, 
uh, chlorophyll production in some of the minor minor uh, parts of the, of the plant health process um, and a lot of those micronutrients availability in the soil is going to be affected by soil pH and so to tie it all back to why soil pH is important. Alright y'all, thanks so much for watching, hope you have a good one.